so I'm a little bit behind on grading your homework. I'll have that on Tuesday. And uh, so, yeah, we're now to today's lecture on spectral theory. And then on Tuesday, we'll have some independent projects and uh, the evaluation, and then we'll wrap it up on next Thursday. You said it was OK to just turn in. You don't have to present something, right? That's Very correct. Important. That is correct. Uh, I'd like to know what it is, <laughs> unless it was already one of the pre-approved ones. Yeah. OK. I just wanted to present I think one of the pre-approved ones was the first three sections of chapter 6. Um, which was to summarize the theory in a short and and then do some problems in kind of a short paper. You know, lecture 28. <clears throat> so, um, so let's make the ho last homework. We'll make that extra. Um, so homework. I guess it must be 12 then, right? Uh, extra credit. It's kind of hard, but interesting. So, uh, and so when I make that, I made that do uh, next Thursday, next Thursday. So you can ask questions about it then. I'd expect to be turned in by next Thursday if you're going to go ahead and try it. That's so do. do with a extra yeah. We did two, like yeah. Well, it's always this extra is extra. I'm not going to add the points to whatever you had before. Okay? okay. So the official thing, I guess we had 11 homeworks before that. I will drop one completely. You'll have 10 homeworks. Then add some points, however you can. And uh, we did some projects. Yeah, I didn't say how I was going to do with the project, but we might as well just. I don't know. Maybe it's best. Where you, how you want to do the project, you're going to add it into the homework grade. Yeah, just two. decide whatever you I think that's the best. So you're trying to increase your homework grade to the maximum yeah. possible. <laughs> yeah, any kind of extra credit is appreciated, even if it's just a little bit. Do uh, May 4th, then. Okay. Uh, on the spectral theory. It's kind of an interesting problem. You're trying to calculate the spectrum of various situations. Um, but we have to define the spectrum first. So let me say I have a few things I could turn out. Turn. Let's see. I think the homework problems on uh, <coughs> four seven four eight four nine. Did I ever hand out the solutions to those? Four seven four eight four nine. I can't remember if I did hand those out or not. I also had some one-page things. Um, <coughs> You don't seem to have them. Okay, yeah. Four, five, and four, six. We handed those out, right? Four, four, five, and four, six. Four, seven, four, eight, four, nine. That's what I'm looking for. Whether I handed out solutions to that. Ah, I don't seem to have them in my folder either. Okay. I've got them somewhere. Okay. Let's see where I put them. Okay. Oh, really? No, I probably have them somewhere. I'm kind of disorganized. Okay. I have the 411. I have today's homework, but I guess I won't turn that back until next time. Um, okay. Let's see. Notes 10, notes 11. Matt, do you have uh, anything? Missing notes 10 and notes 11 are what we have. Uh, I might have some. Let's get some of these. Yes, I do. Okay. Eric asked me to remind you to put one of these outside your door. Okay. All right. That's on the web now, too, though, so that won't be so critical. Okay. So here's a notes 12. Uh, here's one notes 12. Here's one handout on 411 through 413. <clears throat> um, then I also have another notes 12. There are a couple typos in these notes 12, but uh, anyway. 
anyway. And of course, it's all in the book anyway, pretty much, except for a few examples. The homework on, uh, let's say, have four, five, four, six. Was that ever? Ten? I don't think I ever turned that back to you, right? The homework solutions are four, five, and four, six. Probably not, since I have a bunch of copies here. Okay. And then four seven, four eight, four nine. I don't know where I. I don't think I ever photocopied them. That's my problem. It's sitting in here somewhere, in my stuff. Um, four seven, four eight, four nine. I know I did them. Okay. Where are they? Okay. So I'll have to hand that back next time. All right, let's get started on spectral theory then. Okay. So I have some theorems from notes uh, 11 on that still, but I think I'll just start on notes 12 anyway um, <clears throat> to uh, And then I'll refer back to the end of notes 11 if I need to. There's, there's some, uh, a basic limit at the end there. But let's just sort of see what the heck is a spectrum. So the first thing that's done is the finite dimensional case in chapter 7. So spectral uh, theory in the finite dimensional case. Maybe we'll kind of go through that just a little bit. <clears throat> because you have at least one problem on that. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take a, this is recall eigenvalues. Let A be a square matrix. Let's just take a very simple example. 5, 4, 1, 2 is a square matrix and represent, uh, uh, represents uh, a linear transformation T R2 to R2 um, in the standard basis of R2 what would that mean? How, do you remember how a matrix represents something in the standard basis? Um, the first column is the uh, the first column is the coordinate matrix of the image of the first element of your basis. Okay, so this A would mean that um, E1 goes to 5E1 plus 4E2, and E2 goes to where uh, the standard basis of R2, let's call it E1, E2. Okay. E2 would go to 4 E1 plus 2 E2. Okay, that's the mapping. And then extend linearly. Okay, uh, that's how the matrix works. These columns are the coordinate representations. This, the 5 and the 4 are called the coordinate representation of, of 5 E1 plus 4 E2. All right, if E1, E2 is the basis. This is, okay, 5. Excuse me, what did I say? I made a mistake here. This was 1. 5, 1 equals the e sub E equals the coordinate representation. He calls this E for his basis. <coughs> coordinate representation of 5, of the vector X equals 5E1 e plus 1E2. Okay. <coughs> That's how you do it. Okay, so so presumably if I gave you, so what is the T actually then? So T, so T of C, if I write it T, C1, C2, in the usual RT, so this is just the usual element of R2. So the standard basis, 1, 0, and 0, 1. C1, C2 would be the coordinate vector of in the standard basis, 1, 0, and 0, 1. Okay, so this is 5, C1, plus 4C2, comma, um, C1, plus 2C2. So if I put in uh, T of 1, 0, for example, then I do indeed get 5, 1, okay? 
Okay. Okay. So what are the eigenvalues? Eigenvalues of A. There are any solu uh, any complex uh, solution. Even though I'm working with a real matrix A here, we might be working with complex matrices too. Solution to the equation the determinant of A minus lambda I is equal to zero. So how does that come out? That comes out to be five minus lambda four. In this example, one, two minus lambda. That's, uh, if I work out this polynomial, I think I'll just, uh, well, five minus lambda, two minus lambda minus one times four equals to zero, or lambda squared minus seven lambda plus six equal to zero, or lambda equals one and six if I factor the thing, okay? So you have two eigenvalues, which, and what you're getting there is if the determinant is zero when I plug in lambda equals one, and the determinant is zero if I plug in lambda equal to six. Sometimes you call this P of lambda for the characteristic polynomial. We've all seen that before. So P of one is, P of one is equal to P of six is equal to zero. And so that means that in particular that A minus lambda I by the singularity theory, right? The, the matrix is non-singular if and only if the determinant is non-zero, okay? It means it's singular when the determinant is zero. So A minus, A minus one I and A minus six I are singular. All right, therefore there's a non-zero uh, solution to the homogeneous equation means that A minus uh, if and only if there exists V1 and V2, both non-zero, all right, so that A minus 1I times V1, uh, I'll just call it V, well, he calls it X1, maybe we're going to call it X1 and X2 for two vectors, yeah, because our X's, we use C's for coordinates, so X's are saved for vectors in this course, <laughs> I forgot, I keep forgetting. That's the case. <laughs> uh, that's nice. A, the x1 is equal to uh, 0, and um, a minus 6i, x2, is equal to 0. And we can actually solve for those, and you've done that before in your uh, solution is x1 equals 4, 1. I said, let's see, what is a1 minus 1i? So we can just verify it. a minus 1i a minus 1i is equal to 4, 4, 1, 1, and x1 is equal to uh, one solution. But x1 is not unique, of course. If I, any scale, non-zero scalar multiple of x1 is, again, satisfying this homogeneous equation, because the scalar comes off, scalar times zero is zero. So x1 is not unique, but, um, one representation then of an x1 is 4, 1, and I think you got an x2. Let's say a minus 6i is uh, minus 1, 4, 1 minus 4, and x2 equals, I don't know if you can read this, all the way over on the side of the board, 1 minus 1. So these were a couple non-zero solutions. Those are called eigenvector. This is called an eigenvector. What's the main thing about an eigenvector? How do you... Sh eigenvector, this is an eigenvector. An eigenvector, the main property you can use about eigenvectors later on, eigenvectors are never zero. The eigenvalue can be zero, but the eigenvector can never be zero. So if the only, for example, later on you're going to have some operators that say, well, prove there are no eigenvalues. Prove there are no eigenvalues. One of the basic techniques is to show any solution to uh, such a type of equation, all right, has only, no matter what uh, lambda is, the only, type, the only solution is a zero vector, if that's the case. No eigenvalues, you see. So that's the basic thing. Okay. In other words, showing that uh, 
maybe you can't compute this characteristic polynomial anymore in the infinite dimensional case, right? So you don't know exactly what that is. But you can prove that a minus lambda i times x equal to zero has only <coughs> a trivial solution x equal to zero, then there's no eigenvalues. If, if, if for all lambda there's only x equal to zero, then there are no eigenvalues, right? Because x equal to zero does not count as an eigenvector. You understand? what I'm getting at here? So there's a slightly different approach than you're used to. Here I don't have to worry about it. When I find my lambda, hey, I know there's an x non-zero, I just find it. Okay. But in the more general approach, you have to be a little bit remindful of that fact, that x is not equal to zero. Okay. Do I have it backwards? Yes, probably. Uh, I probably wrote them down wrong. Okay. As you can see, let's see if I got them right on the notes. X1, yeah, X1, because I did A6 first. Okay, instead of A, A1 first, that was messing me up. So this is the 1 minus 1, and this was the 4, 1. That's correct. Okay, so what you have is that uh, AX equals lambda X, of course, is what you're getting. So you have... Uh, a x1 equals 1 times x1 and a x2 equals 6 times x2. The way I order it here is slightly different than in the notes. I reverse the order. Okay. So, um, Uh, I think for one of your problems, you just note this, the fact that what is P of zero? P, so P of lambda is a polynomial of degree N. This is uh, N in lambda, okay? And what's the constant term? Would be P of zero, therefore. Sometimes this is, is a slightly obvious fact, but you just, I'm just going to point it out at this point. This is going to be a polynomial of degree n. Just think about the determinant, how the determinant is calculated in the n by n case by uh, cofactor expansion or something. Okay, And you'll see by induction that the polynomial has degree n because there are n lambdas in here. Okay, uh, When a is n by n. And what happens? Well, how do you know? How do you know when a polynomial? What's the what's the uh, constant term in a polynomial? That's when you plug in lambda equal to zero, right? Just think about a polynomial as a zero plus a one lambda plus a two lambda squared. So therefore, p of zero equals constant term. But of course, just by plugging in lambda equal to zero into that, you get that's equal to the determinant of a. Okay, so that comes in handy at one point in your calculations and these little problems. Okay. Um, so lambda equal to zero will be an eigenvalue uh, if and only if the determinant of A is equal to zero. Okay, itself. That's kind of obvious. But let's see where else it comes in. Now, if you have a finite dimensional space and you represent uh, you can always represent a uh, linear transformation from the space back to itself, okay, by a matrix, as I was mentioning, okay, before. And if you change basis, okay, so then what happens? Does the characteristic polynomial change? Do you remember that stuff? Well, maybe you didn't have that in linear algebra. If t, if x is finite dimensional, I don't know if I want to go through all of this because it's going to take me too long. Um, and, then, and you have a linear, and T is linear, is a linear transformation, then uh, let, let, let E equals E1 through E, let's say, of dimension N. So you have a basis of linearly independent vectors E1 through EN, I call, he just calls it E. And then you talk about uh, the matrix of the linear transformation, T sub E, okay? 
That you can talk about. He doesn't put the square brackets, but they do in your linear algebra course. <laughs> okay. So what is that? Um, how does that represent the matrix? Well, so that transforms... Uh, and what you're going to do is you're going to have um, x1 is going to be uh, c1 through cn. Okay, that's actually the coordinate matrix relative to E. Okay, I should also put maybe square brackets there uh, if, you, if you want to. With square brackets means it's a coordinate representation. Okay, means that x1 is equal to actually summation ci ei. I, it was an actual vector in x. Okay. So what happens is that uh, what you do is is you need to, and then you put y1 equals. Uh, Maybe I don't put a Y1 in there. Yeah. No. Well, I can put it this way. A to 1 through A to N. That's right. Sub E. Okay. Then what, what's happening is that uh, the T, E, however Y1 gets... Okay. So then uh, what you get is that uh, A to 1 through A to N sub E equals the matrix of the transformation times it transforms the coordinate vectors in the usual matrix multiplication manner. Okay, that's what the matrix of the transformation is. Okay, so again, if I put C1 equals 1 and all the other Cs equal to 0, corresponding to the first basis element E1, okay, so this, this is represented by By um, one zero zero zero, okay, in the in the basis E, okay. So what happens is that uh, the first column of T will be the matrix, the coordinate representation of the image of T E one, okay. So the first column of T. equals coordinate representation. I don't know if I'm doing the best notation in the world, but I think you got the idea um, of T E1. Okay. Okay. Etc. Now, what happens when I change basis? So then I have, so I can talk about the characteristic polynomial of this matrix, right? A. If I call this A, then I have a characteristic polynomial of A. What happens if I change to a different basis? If E tilde equals E1 tilde up to En tilde, okay, is another basis, then what you have is that um, what you can think of is this, is that E tilde equals uh, E. You think of it as a row vector, okay? This row vector, E times some matrix C, okay, some non-singular matrix C. C non-singular. So I'm talking about E1 tilde over to EN tilde equals E1 over to EN times some, uh, does that make sense? Times some C11, C12 over to C1N down to CN1 over to CNN. So what does it mean? It means that, that E1 tilde would be some linear combination of the E's, right? given by the first column of C. 
So E1 tilde equals E1 C11 plus and so on plus E N C N1. The author has the greatest notation I've ever seen. This is a very streamlined notation in this text that if they use that in linear algebra, <laughs> everybody would be lost <laughs> probably the first time around because it's so streamlined. But maybe they wouldn't be if we learned how to teach that way. But <laughs> it's, it's a nice notation. Okay. So everything basically is matrix multiplication, but you have to, but it has this possibility, of, the flexibility of allowing uh, abstract objects in there. Okay. So that's the understanding. So you can write it that way. In this case, then, if I now write uh, B equal the matrix of the transformation, okay, so it's going to have different columns, right? Because now, uh, uh, first I'm going to be applying T to E1 tilde, okay, and then I'm going to be getting the coordinate representation of that in E tilde basis, okay, that's not going to be the same, but it turns out that if I define this, then by going through the calculations, you get that B is equal to C inverse AC. Okay, I'm not going to go through the calculations. So it's a similarity transform of A. That's a good exercise. Given just that much information, I'm convinced that given you enough time, you would be able to work out this equation. Okay? Or just look at the book. <laughs> okay? This much information, so dot, dot, dot. This gives this. Okay? And so then what you get then is what about the characteristic polynomial of this? Okay, how are they related? Well, this is an old exercise you had. Uh, let's see, let's calculate the D to B minus lambda I. Then this comes out to be the determinant of C inverse AC minus lambda I by plugging in. And now what can you do? You can, you can factor out a C inverse from the left and a C from the right. And that works nicely because C inverse and C will commute with this diagonal matrix. Or that is that I can write lambda i as C inverse lambda i C. So this becomes the determinant. The determinant does not do anything. All I'm using is the fact that I can factor this expression a minus, with a minus lambda i in the middle at this point. Okay. Then I use the fact that the determinant is multiplicative. The C is not singular. Well, of course, C is not singular is given by the fact that uh, you had two bases. Okay. And you multiply that out, you get this is determinant of C inverse times the determinant of A minus lambda I times the determinant of C, which is equal to the determinant of A minus lambda I. So the characteristic polynomial doesn't change. So therefore, changing the basis does not change the eigenvalues. Okay, so it depends only on the transformation, not on the basis. Okay. Um, now there was one little exercise here. I think I wrote the matrix wrong, but it was a cute little exercise that I hadn't thought about. I can't remember proving this in linear algebra. We always just stated it that the geometric multiplicity was always less than or equal to the algebraic multiplicity. Remember that little theorem? Do you remember how to prove it? Okay. <laughs> remember always the theorem. So let's just do the exercise 7.1 number 14 using these ideas so far. I think I may have written an error in the notes, so I'll correct it at this point. Um, what do you have? So suppose now, so 7.1 number 14, and just to finish this discussion on finite dimensional case. If... Um, well, what we know is that, yeah, okay, let A be, let A be of uh, dimensions n by n. Let A be n by n, n by n matrix. And then the P of lambda can be factored completely over the complex numbers. P of lambda equals uh, lambda 1 minus lambda to some a1 or alpha 1 
alpha 1 times lambda r minus lambda to some alpha r. There might only be r distinct eigenvalues where r is something less than or equal to n um, where alpha 1 plus and so on plus alpha r is equal to n. And the alphas are called the algebraic multiplicity. Alpha i equals algebraic multiplicity. of um, lambda i. Okay. Then what's the geometric multiplicity? Geometric multiplicity of lambda i is defined to be the dimension of the uh, set of all vectors x such that ax equals lambda i x. Okay, here in this set of vectors, you allow x to equal to zero. This is called the eigenspace. This is the eigenspace. It's the null space of a minus lambda i x. A minus lambda i equals null space of a minus lambda i, lambda sub i of capital I, okay? So it's the null space of that. So it is, a, it is a vector space in its own right, okay? So it's just how many linearly independent eigenvectors you have. That's a dimension, okay? And the claim is that this dimension, uh, we call this um, beta i or something, beta i equals this. The claim is that the beta i is always less than or equal to alpha i. And that seems very reasonable, but I think we should be able to prove that. <laughs> okay. So, uh, in other words, maybe somehow uh, some of the dimensions are smaller, maybe some of them can be bigger and still get this characteristic polynomial. How would that work? Well, no. So let's see if we can get that. So suppose then that um, maybe I should call I think I called this instead of beta I called it M in the notes, but uh, so put put M equals to beta I <laughs> so I could so I don't have such a nasty notation, okay? Then, um, if E1 tilde through EM tilde, okay, are linearly independent eigenvectors, spanning uh, this, the eigenspace of lambda i, okay, well, let's just say of lambda 1. Let's just put m equals beta 1. Let's just do it for i equals 1. That's what I want, okay? Let's just do it for i equals 1. So make that i into a 1 just by messing it up a little bit. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, then that's what we have. Then we can fill out... Uh, we can use... We can use... Then we use... Uh, E1 tilde through EM tilde uh, as the first M elements of a basis of our vector space. Okay. And this is a this the A was the N by N matrix representing the transformation in some basis, okay? And then we just fill this out. So you have now a basis E tilde equals E1 tilde, E2 tilde, up to EM tilde, and then more, EM plus 1 tilde, up to EN tilde. So you just complete the basis using those first M eigenvectors. So E1 through EM are eigenvectors for the eigenvalue lambda 1. <coughs> okay, and so it represents this linear transformation with respect to the new basis. 
represent uh, so here let a b n is representing t x to x x of dimension n I'll just put this back so everybody knows what we're talking about uh, in some basis which you may think of as E1 through EN because I've gone to the E tildes here but what I'm doing is I've taken E1 tilde through EM tilde eigenvectors for eigenvalue lambda 1 that are linearly independent and they span this eigenspace all right so there's M of them because that's my assumption the M of them so this represent okay now represent now represent T <coughs> uh, in terms of this new basis Okay, then you get, what is it? You'll get uh, T sub E tilde will look like what? Okay, well, I claim that the first upper left corner is, is going to be diagonal because um, what's it going to be? It's going to be... Um, Let's see, I need the, what's the coordinate representation of E1 tilde? It's going to be lambda 1 E1 tilde, right? So I'm going to have a lambda 1 here, and then zeros all the way down here. I think I put the wrong, I put a row instead of a column when I wrote this matrix. In the notes, you should put the transpose of the matrix that I'm writing. Just put a super T if you're reading off these notes. Okay? So this is correct. Then what about the second factor, T? E2 tilde is equal to lambda 1 E2 tilde, right? TE1 tilde equals lambda 1 E1 tilde. TE2 tilde equals lambda 1 E2 tilde. And so on, TEM tilde is equal to lambda 1 EM tilde. So that means the first column of the matrix representation is lambda 1 and then 0. It's the second column is 0, lambda 1. All I'm using is this, this column by column uh, representation of the matrix and so on. And then you get a 0. Dot, 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 zero, zero, zero down to uh, lambda one here. Okay. So this is the upper m by m square matrix here. And then what do you have is just a bunch of junk after that. Uh, and so, but this is zeros all the way down here. Zeros in these first m columns. Okay. And so then after that you just have uh, b. 1 m plus 1 over to b 1 n and down here down to b um, n m plus 1 and then over to b n n okay just the remaining columns are just arbitrary okay then what's uh, what's if this is b equals this what's the characteristic polynomial of b okay I claim that uh, d b minus lambda i. They'll calculate that. I claim that, of course, um, if I put, how do I actually calculate that? Let's do the cofactor expansion by the first column, right? If I, first, I put a minus lambda here then, so b minus lambda i. Do a little creative arithmetic here on the board, sorry. <laughs> put the lambdas here, okay, and then some more minus lambdas over here, okay? <clears throat> Equals this. So if I do the cofactor expansion by the first column, what do I get? I get lambda 1 minus lambda, okay? And I uh, let's see. I've done this, and so I cancel this and out and this out, and that's and then time to determine of what's left here. And then I do again this, the fir the first column with the smaller matrix. Okay. So then I do do I do this business? So I get another lambda one minus lambda. Okay. And then finally, uh, I get this business lambda one minus lambda, and then I get this. I have an upper triangular matrix. Okay, block triangular matrix. So you know how to calculate the determinant. Actually, that's much faster. You take this block times the determinant of this block. Okay, and this block up in the upper right hand corner is gone. Okay, so this is lambda one minus lambda times the determinant of the lower right block. Uh, 
<clears throat> BM plus 1, M plus 1, over to BM plus 1, N, and down to B N M plus 1, over to BN, N. Okay? Minus lambdas on the diagonal. Okay. So, you just get some other uh, polynomial of degree N minus M sticking on there. Okay? So, what I have is that this, what do I know? I know that lambda minus, lambda 1 minus lambda to the M divides P of lambda. P of lambda isn't different because we just proved that theorem, or proved that result, or at least indicated that the uh, basis doesn't affect the characteristic of polynomial. All right, and so if lambda minus lambda one minus lambda to the n divides this one, that means m is less than or equal to alpha one. Because if m was greater than alpha one, it wouldn't divide anymore according to our usual rules of algebra. <laughs> okay, I think we'll, we'll, we're not going to go try to prove that part. Okay, so this is a simple, simple uh, calculation based on what we were doing so far. So now you can teach your linear algebra class. But you've got to get to chapter 8 in the book where you do <laughs> transformations. They get a little <laughs> squirrely. Okay, about that, but... Okay, now what is the spectrum in the general case? This is kind of a difficult uh, definition, actually. Okay, in the finite dimensional case, we just get eigenvalues, a complex, n complex eigenvalues counting multiplicities. Okay, in other words, the alpha 1 plus and so on plus alpha r is equal to n. Okay, so n complex eigenvalues. The, the, the geometric multiplicities may not be adding up to. And in fact, what what is the case where there's only uh, one? Let's see. What is it? What is a good example? Um, you need to have some examples in your back pocket, right? Uh, what's the basic uh, example example of a matrix where there's only uh, uh, there there's only one distinct eigenvalue, but there are uh, the eigenspaces of dimension one only. In other words, the algebraic multiplicity is two, let's say for two by two, but the geometric plus multiplicity is one. You need to know that example, right? So I think this is the two by two case. Uh, A equals this. Quick example. Just so you won't, you have to have this if you go on to the next course in linear algebra, of course. Have you all had some of that stuff? Some of you had it. You all had it. All right, so what's the, so what's the algebraic, what's the, Two eigenvalues here. Lambda one, lambda equals one and one, right? Those are the eigenvalues. And what's the eigenspace? If I take uh, a minus one i, I get zero one zero zero. Okay. And what's the homogeneous solution to that thing? Um, I get uh, eigenvectors x. Let's see. I've got to solve uh, 0, 1, 0, 0 equals 0, 0. So it's already row reduced echelon form. I just get um, uh, C2 equals T and C1 equals, well, there is no C1, right? C1 is, is this anything? Wait a second. Oh, C2 equals 0. And C1 is anything. Okay? Okay. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So, anyway, I, get, I just get one, one eigenvector, 1, 0, right? Okay. So, geometric multiplicity one. Okay, and then you can extend this by right. Isn't that how you do it? What what does this thing look like? If you try to extend it to a three dimensions, you put a super diagonal or something like that. Huh? 
I think this this has again algebraic multiplicity. I mean the uh, Algebraic multiplicity of the eigenvalue one is three, but the geometric multiplicity of the uh, eigenspace is just one. Right? If I subtract this thing off, then I get both C three and C two have to be zero. Okay. Again, I just get one zero zero is the only eigenvector. Okay. So you can have that kind of a situation. So I have an n by n matrix that has uh, one eigenvalue with geometric multiplicity one. Okay. Spectrum. What's the spectrum? Okay. So give, given us a norm space and some linear operator. So x is a norm space, not the zero space. So it shouldn't be trivial. And T is some uh, linear operator. We're only going to work the linear with domain of T, of course, a subset of X. And define T lambda equals T minus lambda I. Okay? And if T lambda inverse exists, we'll call the uh, resulting uh, operator R lambda. So that's going to be called the so-called resolvent equals T sub lambda to the minus one. So this is, when that exists, right, um, we sort of expect uh, that lambda is not an eigenvalue because that was the case. Uh, uh, T lambda was singular, okay, when I had the eigenvalue, right? So, but here we're going to have a slightly different theory. We're going to have, define the resolvent set rho of T as all, as the set of lambda in the complex plane, so we're working with the complex plane. Our, our uh, resolvent set is a subset of a uh, complex plane. Complex numbers lambda. So that the following three requirements hold. So that all three of the following requirements hold. And they have a little table on the bottom of page um, 371. That's the one I want you to refer to. Okay. There's a little table that defines the spectrum. So having that somehow emblazoned on your mind would be helpful. <laughs> it's a little bit hard to read. But there are three conditions. And so working with the spectrum is pretty much what we have to do here at the first step. And the resolvent set. The resolvent set, such that the following, all three of the following requirements hold. R for requirement or for resolvent, okay? R1 is that R lambda exists. That is, that, that uh, T lambda is injective, okay? It is one to one, okay? That's all, from the domain of T. Uh, obviously, if T lambda has the same domain, okay? I can always take lambda i times any vector, okay? So the domain of T lambda is the same. So it's a question of whether this is one-to-one -one operator or not on dt. Okay, R2 would be that R lambda is bounded, okay? And R3, so not only is it, uh, I mean, our, in the finite dimensions, our, when we are off the eigenvalues, of course, the corresponding T lambda. So if lambda is not an eigenvalue, the T lambda is non-singular, and of course it's a bounded. Okay? The inverse is bounded, too. Okay? Everything is right. But now we have to specify it's bounded. Okay? 
and then so the inverse is bounded the inverse of t lambda equals t lambda inverse is bounded and finally the third one is that the domain of r lambda okay which is the image of this t lambda is um, dense in x okay Those are the three requirements. And then you have an element of the resolvent set. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take the complement of this set and call that the spectrum. Okay? So it's kind of odd. But there's these two pieces that make up the whole complex plane. This set and then the spectrum. And that is going to be divided into three pieces. Okay. So everything's going to be divided up nice. So it's actually the complex plane is going to be a union of four pieces. The resolvent set and three disjoint pieces of the spectrum. Where the spectrum and the resolvent are themselves just complementary, all right? Complements of one another. So then, okay, the spectrum, I know there doesn't seem to be any reason to do this except that it works nicely. The spectrum is as follows. Sigma t, the whole spectrum, is defined to simply be the complex plane minus the resolvent set. So you sort of define it through the back door, but then you break it into three pieces. By basically breaking these three conditions down. I think these three conditions are the key, uh, you know, can I even get started by having something, uh, an inverse existing? Okay, and then could it be bounded? And then could it be depi- defined on all of X? Okay, because if this domain is dense, then I can uh, extend the operator. Okay, there's an operator as long as, uh, let's see, I think there was an extension theorem way back in Chapter 2, which we didn't prove in class. That's when we were still playing around early and, and we were still trying to just get through the chapter. But um, uh, there's an extension theorem, bounded linear extension, if if you have a map if okay, if you have a mapping from a norm space to a Bonach space, okay, so if the original uh, X here is a Bonach space anyway, and I've got a, a dense uh, domain. Okay, then I can extend the operator to the whole, uh, to the closure of that domain, which is the whole space. Okay, so as long as X is a Bonnock space, then I can, uh, under R3, I could uh, extend R lambda to all of X. Okay, so I get the bounded inverse under all these three. Okay. <clears throat> as long as X was a bond X space. So you can see how the, uh, the bond inverse theorem with the open mapping theorem, its, its basis is coming in here. Okay. So the spectrum is defined to be this, and then I'm going to define that into three pieces. The point spectrum, sigma sub P of T. So say a sigma sub sigma of T is going to be the union, in turn, the disjoint union, by breaking up and you see I have, I have a, what I have three conditions R1 and R2 and R3 and if I take the the logical negation of that right what's the logical negation of R1 and R2 and R3 the logical negation of that is not R1 or not R2 or not R3 but these are not disjoint possibilities Right, so I have to somehow, right? I, mean, I can have not R1 and not R2 at the same time, right? Or at least, uh, or not. Uh, anyway, you'll see when I write it down. Okay, so in order to make it a dis, uh, disjoint possibilities, we have to do some playing around here. Okay, so what is it? Is that, it's given on the bottom of the table? Okay, on page 371. Okay, so for sigma sub p sub t, we're just going to say that, okay, t lambda is not injective. This is a set of lambda such that t lambda is not injective. Okay, it's not one to one. Okay, so in other words, r lambda does not exist. Okay. 
I'm not going to get any theorems here today, obviously. I'm only going to be able to do examples. Okay, but this, this I might state one to use. Okay, another one would be, um, so that's one thing. So that just means R1 is not satisfied. Okay, and then another possibility is that R2 is not satisfied, but both R1 and R3 are. Okay, so that's the continuous spectrum, sigma sub t of t is a set of all lambdas such that um, that R lambda exists and with dense domain but R lambda is not bounded. Okay, so these are a little bit technical at this point. Mostly we're going to be considered whether, uh, well, most of the time, I won't say always, most of the time, whether just what's sigma of t and what's sigma sub p of t, okay? Sigma, sub, si sigma of t as the complement of rho of t, okay? But then there's these other pieces, and then sigma, what's left, okay? So this was R, this was not R1, okay? This was... not R1, okay? This is not R2, but then you have uh, R1 and R3, okay? So what could the, what's left? Well, I have to consider not R3, okay? And then what, what makes sense? Not R3, but R1 holds, okay? This is not R3, but R1 holds. Let's see. So that means you have lambda such that uh, R lambda exists, but uh, dense, but domain is not dense. It doesn't say whether the thing is bounded or not, okay? doesn't say whether the thing is bounded or not. Uh, it's definitely not bounded in the continuous spectrum, okay? It may or may not be bounded for the point spectrum. Okay, it doesn't make sense, because I, I can't, can't talk about uh, it being bounded or not, okay? So for, because in the point spectrum, I can't talk about uh, R2 or R3. Right? So I can't even talk about them. Okay. In the continuous spectrum, uh, anyway, so that it does make sense as a disjoint union. You have to get down on your hands and knees a little bit and look at it a little bit closer in terms of breaking these conditions down and see that those are disjoint possibilities. Comments about that? Maybe we should just go to an example straight away. Okay. One of them is kind of simple. It's given in the book, but let's have a look at it anyway. So what we're going to need to do is look at some operators on L2, on all other kind of spaces. L2, uh, <laughs> is, is one of the simpler examples. Okay, so let's try this one. Um, define T from L2 to L2 by, um, C1, C2, and so on, goes to um, zero. I'm going to put two zeros here, C1, C2, and so on, like that. Okay. So it just looks, I'm not trying to generate this from, uh, well, okay. So what is this what is this operation doing? Is it bounded, okay? Or does it exist? So how do I check this out? Okay. Let's check out one. Let's put lambda equal to zero first. Okay? Where does this lie? Does this lie in the resolvent or in the spectrum?
I think that's all we're going to try to figure out right now. Okay. So the question is, uh, let's just see about R1, whether that holds or not. I've to, I'd have to have all R1, R2, R3 to hold if I'm in the if I'm in the resolvent set. But then I'm going to check R1. Maybe that's the simplest first. And just to see if R1 uh, does not hold, then I'm already washed up for the resolvent set, and I already know that I'm in the point spectrum. Okay? This is R is called the residual spectrum, just what's ever left over. Okay? Okay. So let's just check this out. So the question is, is T0 inverse uh, exist? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to solve the equation T0 inverse of Y is equal to X. Okay, let's see if I can come up with a formula. I'd have T0 inverse of eta 1, eta 2, eta 3, and so on. Okay, this should equal then C1, C2, and so on. All right, you just want to solve F inverse of y equals x. Okay, then what will happen? Now apply t. t0 is just t. Alright? So t0 is just another notation for t. Uh, just t0 equals t minus 0i equals t. Okay, so this becomes then, I just apply t to both sides, so then therefore I should have a to 1, a to 2, and so on, equals to t of C1, C2, okay, and um, which is equal to 0, 0, C1, what am I doing here? Okay, so then I'm going to just try to, all I'm going to try to do is, I should have written this down at the beginning, all I'm going to try to do is solve for the Cs in terms of the eta's, right? So therefore, Let's see, equating point-wise, you'll get C1 should equal A to 3, right? C2 should equal A to 4. C3 should equal A to 5. That's fine. And then also, I should have that A to 1 equals A to 2 equals to 0, right? Also, A to 1 equals A to 2 has got to equal to 0, all right? So the only images I'm going to get must satisfy a to 1 equals a to 2 equals 0. So in particular, the, um, the range of this inverse, excuse me, the range of t is not all of x. So in particular, the domain of t0 inverse, okay, is not dense. Okay, it's not close to being dense. You've got these two coordinates 0, okay? So R3 doesn't hold. Uh, but it does, the inverse does exist, okay? So you have R1 and not R3. Does that make sense? So you're in the residual spectrum. Okay, so R1 is okay. You do have an inverse. I can calculate the Cs in terms of the Eta's uniquely. Does that make sense? As long as a to 1 equals a to 2 is equal to 0. That makes sense. So R1 is there and uh, let's see, R and R3, not R3, holds. Okay? Because the uh, range, the range of T0 is a set of all a to 1, a to 2, and so on, such that a to 1 equals a to 2 is equal to 0. So this is not dense in little l2. Take anything in little l2 that has the first coordinate not 0, for example. Then it can't be approximated by any of these vectors. Right? So that goes with this, and so on. So therefore, zero is in the residual spectrum. <laughs> okay, it's kind of a... Now the question is, what's the rest of the spectrum here? Uh, and is there anything uh, else in the spectrum, and so on? <coughs> uh, 
I think maybe I should give you a hint uh, on how to do uh, one of the problems, like the first problem in this section, okay, just so you can get going on it. Um, what the first problem is seven point, uh, excuse me, the first problem on, on calculating inspection seven point two number one, I believe. Let me see about that. Seven point two is it? No, not number one. Seven point three number one. It tells you the answer, but I still think it might be worthwhile looking at it just a little bit. So in this problem, they ask you to find the spectrum. is that X is C01 and you're, and you're going to take V as a particular element of C01. V equals V of T is going to be an element of C01. And what you're going to do is you're going to define the mapping TX to equal, uh, so it's going to be defined on all of X back to X and it's going to be defined as just V times X. So in other words, X of T goes to V of T times X of T. Okay. Now, uh, what's T lambda then? T lambda X is equal to V minus lambda X. In other words, X of T goes to V of T minus lambda times X of T. Okay. Now the question is, if I if I call this uh, okay, so what happens? Suppose I call that. Um, How am I going to start this problem? If I call this y of t, okay, then I need to solve, I need to invert this relationship between x and y, right? How do I do that? I just divide, right? So this gives me that the inverse operation would be x of t is equal to y of t divided by v of t minus lambda. So somehow you're going to have to invert, try to invert the relationship to see if the inverse exists. That's kind of hard, you might think sometimes. But in some cases you actually can have a formula for the inverse. Okay? Because it's a linear mapping. Okay? So actually they have a theorem in here uh, in section 7.3 about uh, inversion. Okay? That um, You can actually have a representation theorem. You actually have a power series for the resolvent, okay? As long as you're in the resolvent set, so you can actually come up with a a formula, okay, for the inverse in some cases. So here you have it. Now, um, does that make sense? Does that make sense? As a continuous function, in other words, this has got to be back as a continuous function. Does this make sense as a continuous function? Yeah, well, how do you know that? Okay, so why don't you take two cases? Case one was that V of T naught is equal to lambda, so fix lambda. Okay. Case one, V of T naught is equal to lambda of some T naught. In case two, uh, V of T is never equal to lambda, all t, all t in the unit interval. Okay. So what happens in case one? In case one, then um, x will not be continuous unless the y of t naught 
is equal to zero, right? Case one, x of t is not in x, or x is not in x, unless um, y of t naught is equal to zero. Okay, somehow, and then you could get a continuous function by canceling the zeros. Okay. So where does that take you? Okay. So in particular, uh, you won't be in the resolvent set because R3 won't happen. In other words, Y, if Y of T0 is equal to 0, that will put a condition that uh, the domain of, so I still may get the uh, resolvent to exist. I haven't really fully explored that, but I don't, what I need to know is that the lambda would not be in the resolvent. Let's say I'm not trying to figure out exactly where lambda is, just whether it's in the resolvent or not. Okay. This implies that the resolvent, that, um, that, that, um, this, the set of all y in C01, such that y of T0 is equal to 0, is not dense. In C01, okay? If I take uh, a continuous function and make one of the values 0, then that's not going to be dense, okay? So if I'm considering all functions, they have to go to 0 at some point, okay? then that's not going to be close to some function which is not zero at that point. Okay, you can never, in other words, I can't approximate this constant function, for example, by functions of this type, because it's the max norm. It's not an integration norm, it's the max norm. If it was an integration norm, I could do it, but it's not. Okay, so this, this set of functions is not dense, and therefore I'm not in the resolvent in case one. What about in case two? So in case one, so lambda is not in the resolvent. Okay. What about case two? Suppose v of t is never equal to lambda, then everything's fine. Because now I have a continuous function. y of t over uh, v of t minus lambda is continuous. All right, so now our lambda inverse exists. I mean, our lambda exists. <coughs> so in case two, R lambda exists. What about the other two? Is it bounded? I'll leave that to you. Okay? I leave the rest of it to you, but you can easily show because you have uh, continuous functions, what is it? Uh, uh, what's the actual. Uh, there'll be a bound, in fact. V of t minus lambda. Uh, will be never zero, and uh, in fact, uh, one over v of t minus lambda will uh, be bounded above, right? Because of, of compactness, okay? So, so one over v of t minus lambda will be less than or equal to uh, some constant less than infinity for all t in zero, one, in case two, all right? So then you'll actually have that R lambda is bounded too, and so on, okay. And in this case, then, the domain of R lambda is all of C01, okay. So there won't be any problem. Uh, so what do you get? You get that... Uh, <coughs> I'll leave the, detail, the rest of the details you to write up. But basically, in case two, then lambda is in the spectrum. Okay. I did, I'm sorry, did I have it right? No, I don't have it right. So lambda is, I'm sorry, lambda is in the resolvent in this case. Okay, all three conditions are holding. Okay, in case two. So what does that mean that uh, you have lambda not in the resolvent in case one, and lambda is in the resolvent in case two? So what does that give? I think you, you'll uh, see what that gives because, in fact, what you have is that um, is that the set of all t 
such that, uh, well, so what is, what is V of the unit interval? The V of the unit interval is a closed, it's actually, it's a compact, so in particular it's closed. And actually in the real case it's just an interval, okay? I think in the answers in the back they're assuming a real case, but you don't have to assume a real case for this problem. Okay, so what's happening is that uh, if you're in that compact set, okay, if lambda is in that compact set, that means V of T naught equals lambda sum T naught, then what did I say? That was um, not in the resolvent. But if you are outside of that compact set, then you are in the resolvent. So doesn't that just define the resolvent? Okay, just define the resolvent as everything that's outside of this compact set. Everything that's outside of that compact set. Okay, this is equal to the resolvent. So it's compact set in C. All right, or if, if you consider V to be real value, that's just a compact set on the real line, and then that's the resolvent. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the sigma. The outside of the compact set is Isn't that how it worked out? If it was inside, then okay, so if you in case one that was lambda is not in row of T, that means lambda is in the spectrum. Okay, if you're not in the resolving, you are in the spectrum. And I'm saying so this implies that case one implies that you are in the spectrum. Okay. But then the question is whether uh, there's anything else into the spectrum, okay? But if you're outside this compact set, then you um, are in the resolvent set. You can, I didn't put all the details, but you do get a resolvent set. All the conditions R1 through R3 do hold, all right? Therefore, you've got the resolvent set is outside this compact set, and this compact set is the, is the uh, spectrum. Okay, so you're not, you're not identifying the point spectrum and the continuous spectrum and the residual spectrum. You're just trying to identify the spectrum here. There's a theorem in this context that we might look at. The spectrum of a bonded linear operator on a complex bonic space is compact and lies in the disk given by the formula lambda less than or equal to t. So sigma of t is in this set, okay, in general, okay? If you're on a comp, if you're on a Bonach space, when X is Bonach, which we do have in this situation, okay? So here's an example, and what we're doing here is we're actually getting the, uh, the norm, what is the norm of, of T in this situation? I do believe you'll find the norm of T is the max norm of V, okay? Actually, it's just the norm of V in this case. The norm of T will be the norm of V. Okay. You might want to check that. Norm of T is equal to the norm of V. Okay. In this case. So, well, and now what we have is this, is just, you know, identifying the spectrum in this particular example that's consistent with the theorem. Okay. But it's actually uh, made, you know, consistent, but it's also explicit that the actual spectrum is identified as this compact set, which is the image of the zero one under V. Okay, we're over time today. So, um, anyway, that's the first one. <laughs> it goes on from there. The next problem is a little bit harder. Okay. So have, have a shot at it. Have a shot at that. Thank you. So next time you're on, Joyce, right? Okay. We're going to have a little independent study talk. And anybody else who wants to do uh, an independent project for more uh, homework credit is more than welcome to do so. I think one of these, one of the projects we mentioned was